Hello. Let's keep reading the Saturdays. Uh, last time we started with Saturday 1, in which the four Melendi children, Mona, Rush, Randy, and Oliver, decided to pool their resources every Saturday, and each one would take turns having some sort of adventure with all the money they'd saved. All they need to do now is get permission from their father and Cuffy, the housekeeper. And so we pick up with Saturday 2. Before we start, uh, there are some French phrases in here, so I apologize for my mispronunciation of some of the words. Of course father said yes, but he had certain conditions which they already knew by heart. They were the same ones he had imposed when they started going to school by themselves. Don't get run over, he said. That's the first and most important rule. Look where you're going and watch the lights when you cross the street. This applies to Randy in particular, who knows, who believes too often that she's walking in another world. A safer, better one. It's the people who make the safety on this earth as well as the trouble, unfortunately. Father glared at the newspaper that lay on the floor beside him. Sometimes I think the golden age must have been the age of reptiles. Well, anyway, uh, let me... What was I saying? Oh, yes, Randy. Uh, and the lights. And another thing. If you get lost or in trouble of any kind, always look for a policeman. Sooner, sooner or later, you'll find one, and he'll know what to do. And don't hesitate to ask him, even if he's the traffic cop at 42nd and 5th, with buses breathing fire on every side. Let's see, what else? Don't talk to strangers, Randy prompted him. Yes, that's right, don't talk to strangers. Unless you know by looking at them that they're kind people, and even then, think twice. Be home no later than quarter to six, and Randy had better make it by five. He picked up his newspaper and flapped it open. That's about all. Oh, one last thing. See that you do something you really want. Something you'll always remember. Don't waste your Saturdays on unimportant things. Yes, that's one of the rules, Mona told him. Is it? Good. Then go with my blessing. Then they went to Cuffy who naturally said yes, too, but not as if she cared for the idea. Well, I hope it's all right, I'm sure. Seems to me like you're pretty young to be kiting all over a big city by yourselves. And one at a time, too, not even together. Don't you get run over now. They couldn't help laughing at that. All grown-ups had learned the same set of precautions, apparently. And it's nothing to giggle about, either, said Cuffy severely. I don't want nobody run over, nor nobody lost, so as we have to get the police out after them. I suppose I can't keep you from getting a little lost once in a while. It'd be against nature. But not so lost that we have to get the police out after you. Good old Cuffy. It was that sort of thing that made them love her so much. If you do get lost, she continued, you can always go up and ask, A policeman! shouted Mona and Randy and Rush in unison. Do you think it's polite to take the words right out of people's mouths? inquired Cuffy, pretending to be offended. And another thing. Don't talk to strangers, they cried. Well, said Cuffy, giving up. I can't say much for your manners, but I'm glad to see you've got the right ideas at least. What about strange policemen? said Rush, looking innocent. Oh, go on with you. Out of my kitchen, the whole tribe of you. Cuffy made sweeping gestures with the broom. My patience is worn about as thin as the sole of my shoe. But that wasn't true, and they knew it. Cuffy's patience was as deep as the earth itself. After a brief discussion, it was decided that Randy, as founder of the club, should have the privilege of the first Saturday. For the next five days, she worked feverishly in her school craft shop whenever she got a chance and by Friday evening she was able to distribute four small pins cut out of copper, and each bearing the mysterious name Isaac. Swear on your sacred word of honor never to tell anyone what this pin means, Randy said to the club members. And they all swore, even Oliver. It was a solemn moment. Saturday dawned much the same as any other day, maybe even a little grayer than most. But when Randy woke up, she had the same feeling in her stomach that she always had on Christmas Day. 
A wonderful morning smell of coffee and bacon drifted up the stairwell from the kitchen, and she could hear a familiar clattering spasm deep in the house. Willie Sloper shaking down the furnace. Mona was still asleep, a mound entirely covered up except for one long trailing pigtail that looked as if it were awake all by itself. Randy lay staring absently at the wall beside her bed where pictures hung at haphazard intervals. She had painted all the pictures herself, and there was a reason for their strange arrangement. The wallpaper was old, and the pictures served to cover up peeled and faded places. They were all drawings of enigmatic-faced princesses and sorceresses. Each had mysterious slanted eyes, a complicated headdress, and elaborate jewels. Each was posed against a background of palaces, rocks, and dashing waves, or forests with unicorns. Don't you ever get tired of drawing Lucrezia Borgia all the time? Rush had once asked her. For a while, Randy lay still just being happy. Then she stretched. Stretched all the way up and way down. During it, she probably grew half an inch. After that, she got out of bed, stepping over her bedroom slippers as usual. Ow, is it cold? Randy complained happily and closed the window with a crash that drew protesting grumbles from the little mountain range that was Mona. The morning finally went by with Randy pushing it every second. It was awful to sit at the lunch table while Cuffy calmly insisted that she must eat everything on her plate. Everything. Oh, Cuffy, even my beets! All your beets, replied Cuffy inexorably, and all your squash. Randy looked witheringly at the food on her plate. Beets are so boring, she said. The most boring vegetable in the whole world next to squash. Not so boring as spinach, said Rush. Spinach is like eating a wet mop. That will be enough of that, commanded Cuffy in the voice that meant no nonsense. At last it was over, even the tapioca and Randy just stopped herself in time from remarking that she considered tapioca the most boring dessert in the world next to stewed rhubarb. Mona came into their room while Randy was changing her dress. "'How'd you like to borrow my ambers?' she asked. "'Oh, Mona!' Randy was overcome. "'Do you mean you let me? Honestly? Oh, I'd be so careful of them. I promise I would.' She felt like a princess in her brown velveteen dress with the amber necklace that had belonged to Mother. "'It's like big lumps of honey,' she said, staring into the mirror. "'Well, don't you lose it now,' admonished Mona, not quite regretting her generosity. "'Have a good time, Ran, and don't forget to, you have to be back by five. "'I won't,' promised Randy, giving her sister a hug. "'Goodbye. You're swell, you're swell to let me wear the ambers.' She said goodbye to everyone, just as though she were going away for a long voyage. Cuffy gazed at her thoughtfully. "'You look awful little to be going off by yourself like this,' she said. "'Now remember, don't you get run over and don't—' "'I won't, I won't!' cried Randy, quickly running down the steps and waving her blue leather pocketbook in which the dollar and sixty cents rattled wealthily. "'My, it's a nice day,' she thought. "'No one else would have thought so.' The sky was full of low clouds, and the air had a damp, deep feeling in it that meant rain after a while. But being by yourself, all by yourself, in a big city for the first time, is like the first time you find you can ride a bicycle or do the dog paddle. The sense of independence is intoxicating. Randy skipped halfway up the block, a leisurely light-hearted skip, and then she walked the rest of the way, stepping over each crack in the pavement. It was very dangerous. She had to be careful because if she did step on a crack, she would be turned into stone forevermore. In Fifth Avenue, the big green buses rattled by like dinosaurs. I'm going to walk, though, Randy decided. I'm going to walk all the way and look in all the windows. So that's what she did. The shop windows were wonderful. Woolworth's dime store was just as wonderful as Tiffany's jewelry store, and she reached 57th Street, in either a very long time or a very short time, she wasn't sure which, because the walk had been so interesting. It was just beginning to rain when she came to the art gallery where the French pictures were being shown for the benefit of war relief. It cost 75 cents to go in, 
So Randy planned to stay a long time and gave her coat to the doorman. The gallery was hushed and dim after the bright, sharp street. The soft rugs on the floor, the soft neutral color of the walls, with each picture glowing beneath its own special light, made her feel as if she had walked into a jewel case. Catalog, miss, said a man at a little desk. His eyeglasses flashed in the dimness. Thank you, Randy said, and took one of the little folders he offered. Then, almost on tiptoe, she stepped into the main room of the gallery. There were a lot of people looking at the pictures and talking to each other as if they were in church, low-voiced and serious. One of the people she knew, and at sight of her, Randy's heart sank. It was old Mrs. Oliphant, the elephant, Rush called her behind her back, who really was old because she had known father's father way back in the last century. She was a big, tall old lady with a lot of furs that smelled of camphor and a great many chains around her neck that got caught on each other. Now and then, she came to the Melendies, and once they had all been taken to Sunday dinner at her house, when it was raining and everybody ate too much, and Oliver got sick on the bus going home. She was nice, Randy supposed, but so far away in her oldness and dignity. She hoped Mrs. Oliphant wouldn't notice her. Pretty soon, she forgot about everything but the pictures. There was a nice one of a girl in an old-fashioned dress playing the piano. She had a snub nose and a long yellow braid, sort of like Mona, only, of course, it was probably a French girl. If she looked at a picture long enough, without being interrupted, Randy could make it come alive sometimes. And now she could almost hear the music the girl in the picture was playing. Quite hard music, probably, but played very stiffly, with a lot of mistakes, the way Mona played. Marvelous substance, murmured a hushed voice behind her, and another hushed voice replied, Unbelievable resilience in the flesh tones. Gee whiz, thought Randy. Are they talking about the picture? And she moved on to the next one, a field all burning yellow in the sunshine. You could tell it was 12 o'clock noon on a summer day, probably July. Randy could nearly smell the heat and hear the locusts in the trees sounding exactly like father's electric razor in the mornings. She was having a good time. She looked at all the pictures. Fat ladies bathing in a brook, a girl with opera glasses, apples and pears on a blue plate, a man in a boat, two dead rabbits, and then all of a sudden she came to the picture that was hers, her very own one. Randy was always finding things that belonged to her in a special way, though ownership had nothing to do with it. Now she had found the picture. The catalog told her that the picture was called the princess, that it had been painted by someone named Jules Clairon in the year 1881. In the picture, a girl about Randy's age was sitting on a garden wall and looking out over an enormous city. She had a solemn little face. Her long hair hung to the sash of her old-fashioned dress, and her high-heeled boots were buttoned almost to the knee. Among the potted chrysanthemums at her feet, sat a black poodle with a red bow on top of his head. On either side, the clipped plane trees were almost bare, and in the distance, the huge city was spread in a dusky web of blue and gray. It was easy to make this picture alive. Randy stared at it fixedly, hardly breathing, hardly thinking, and pretty soon she thought she could smell the mixture of damp earth and burning leaves and smoke from distant chimney pots. She thought she could hear the hum of the city, and the clear voices of children somewhere out of sight. A day had come and gone, years ago, and still it was alive. I wish I'd known that girl, Randy thought. She felt a touch on her shoulder that brought her back to her own world with a start. On her shoulder, she saw a knuckly black glove, and against her cheek she felt the prickling of camphory fur. The elephant, darn it thought Randy crossly, just when I was getting right into that picture, too. Well, well, my, why, Mona, dear, what are you doing here? inquired Mrs. Oliphant in her deep, cavernous voice with its faint foreign accent. Or is it little Miranda? Miranda, replied Randy politely, with a smile that was nothing but stretching the corners of her mouth. 
"'Of course, of course. Mona is the one with the hair,' said Mrs. Oliphant, whacking Randy's shoulder absent-mindedly. "'You seem very interested in this picture, Miranda.' "'I think it's beautiful,' Randy said, sloping her shoulder out from under Mrs. Oliphant's hand as tactfully as she could. "'It isn't so beautiful as I remembered it,' observed Mrs. Oliphant, regarding it with a frown. "'But then I haven't seen it for sixty years. Not since I was eleven years old.' Eleven years old, repeated Randy. It was impossible that Mrs. Oliphant had ever been eleven. Not since the day it was finished, the old lady explained. You see, I was the girl in the picture. You? cried Randy, amazed. Her mouth dropped open half an inch. That is I at the age of eleven, said Mrs. Oliphant, very pleased at Randy's surprise. Not much to look at, was I? "'I think you looked nice,' Randy considered the girl in the picture. "'Interesting and, well, nice. "'I was just wishing I'd known that girl.' "'And how she would have loved knowing you. "'Sometimes she was very lonely,' said Mrs. Oliphant. "'Unfortunately, she disappeared long, long ago.' Randy looked up at her companion's face. What she said was true. The face was so old, crossed with a thousand lines, and the dark, fiery eyes were overhung by such severe black brows, that every trace of the little girl she had once, once been had vanished with the past. "'What was that big city in the distance?' Randy asked. "'It was Paris,' said the old lady with a sigh. "'Who was the dog?' "'Tartuffe,' we called him. He was a selfish old beast and very dull company.' Mrs. Oliphant shook her head and laughed, remembering. Then she looked about her questioningly. "'Who is with you, Miranda? I don't see any of your family.' "'I'm all alone,' Randy told her. "'Alone? How old are you, child?' Ten, said Randy. Mrs. Oliphant shook her head again. "'When I was your age, such a thing was unheard of. My aunts would have fainted dead away at the suggestion.' What a lucky girl you are. Randy agreed. Really, I am lucky, she thought. Well, since we are both alone, suggested the old lady, why don't you come with me and have a cup of tea or an ice cream soda or a chocolate marshmallow walnut sundae or whatever you prefer? Randy was beginning to like Mrs. Oliphant very much. I'd love to, she said. Surrounded by an aura of camphor and eau de cologne, and with all her chains jingling, the old lady swept splendidly from the gallery. Randy followed in her wake like a dinghy behind a large launch. Outside the moist air, out, excuse me, outside, outside, the moist air had become moister. A fine mist was driving down. Mrs. Oliphant disentangled an umbrella from her handbag and the tail of one of her furs. When it was opened, the umbrella proved to be extremely large and deep. They walked under it, close together, as under a small pavilion. "'I've had it for twenty-five years,' Mrs. Oliphant told Randy. "'It's been lost once on a bus, twice on railway trains, and once at the London Zoo. But I always get it back. I call it the Albatross.' After they had walked a block or two, they came to a large hotel which they entered, and the old lady having checked the albatross, led Randy to a large room full of little tables, gilt chairs, mirrors, and palms in fancy pots. At one end of the room, on a raised platform, there was a three-piece orchestra, piano, violin, and cello. All the musicians looked about fifty years old. A waiter who looked old enough to be the father of any one of the musicians led Mrs. Oliphant and Randy to a table by a long window. After a period of deliberation, it was decided that the old lady would have tea and toast, and Randy would have vanilla ice cream with chocolate sauce. And, Francois, said Mrs. Oliphant, bring some petit fours as well. Parfait month, madame, said Francois, creaking agedly away in the direction of the kitchen. Randy did not know what petit fours meant, but she did not like to ask. "'Ah, yes,' said Mrs. Oliphant, when she had uncoiled from her layers of furs, taken off her gloves, untied her scarf, and arranged her necklaces. "'My childhood was a very different thing from yours.' "'Tell me about it,' said Randy. "'Then, please, 
as an afterthought. Would you like to hear the whole story? Yes, yes, please, the whole story, begged Randy, giving an involuntary bounce on the hard chair. She loved to be told stories. And that story we will hear next time when we finish Saturday, too. Thanks for listening.